Hey songwriters, welcome back to another edition of At Home Songwriting. This is one of our live workshops and this is all about the songwriting of Bob Dylan. So many of our members and followers really follow Bob Dylan and he's a major influence for many, many songwriters. So this is an exploration of the writing that Dylan did and how you can use some of the concepts and the structure in your own songs. So really this workshop is more about you and how you can use the tools that Dylan did more so than it's about Bob Dylan. So we're going to analyze some of the songs and see what's going on under the hood and how you can use some of that structure. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that his songs are not that different from a lot of other topics that we've talked about on the channel. So if you like this, please hit subscribe, please share the videos, tell your friends. And if you'd like to join our live workshops online, we meet via Zoom, uh, usually monthly. A lot of times we're meeting more times during the month. So make sure you uh, click the link in the description and get signed up and join our meetup group at Home Songwriting Workshop. So let's jump in, let's go. Today, as you know, we are going to focus on the songwriting of Bob Dylan. So Bob Dylan has always been somebody that comes up in conversation about songwriting because obviously he was a very skilled songwriter. He was a very popular songwriter um, within his time. And then that fan base and his sort of influence has continued over the years because he influenced a lot of a lot of people. Um, what we're going to really focus on today is we're going to listen to and analyze the structure of Dylan songs. We're going to take a look at lyrics. We're going to take a look at melody, harmony, um, and how you can use some of the structures in your own songs. And then this workshop is really about the songs and you and how you can use those in your songwriting more so than than kind of being a biography about Dylan, if that makes sense. But I think what you'll find is Dylan was a product of his time, and I think he was also a product of his influences as well. So Dylan really was inspired by the world of folk music and a lot of folk singer songwriters, but he was also really inspired by literature and poetry. So his influences were like Woody Guthrie, the Carter family, Martin Carthy. Um, he pulled some of his influences from um, African-American spirituals. So he really had a lot of places that he pulled from to really make his own sound. So we're gonna talk a lot about that as well. Um, and as a lot of you know, Dylan had really long songs sometimes where they were more like stories or poems that were set to music which was different than what was happening at the time. So I think that helped him stand out a little bit. And that's something that really is not within the commercial realm these days. I think music has changed uh, since the time of Dylan. Um, and you'll kind of see that Dylan's most popular songs were the ones that were not sort of that long form story song the ones that had the most commercial success followed more of a, uh, I would say a traditional folk or even kind of a pop or rock kind of structure. So one of the things that Dylan did to make those longer songs possible is he really focused on structure and contrast. Because when you're writing such a long song, you will lose your listener if you don't give them like something that changes, right? So what Dylan was doing, if you notice, he would do kind of one section that had a, a set motif or a set sound, and then would alternate with a second section that had a contrasting sound to it. So he would kind of go back and forth. So you got this tension and release thing going on. So you weren't getting bored necessarily, and he was always giving you new information. So I think one of the things that that you'll find is Dylan was using a lot of the tools that we've talked about in other workshops. You know, sometimes, you know, when I say things like verses have four or six lines, people push back a little bit and they'll be like, you know, well, why do I have to do that? Like, what if I want to break the rules? And even Dylan wasn't really breaking the structure rules. What Dylan was doing was breaking content rules, right? So he was using traditional structure to sing about unique or original 
topics that other people weren't writing about. So I think that's what I want you to kind of see within the, the things that we cover today. And I thought we would start off um, kind of listening to what Dylan had to say a little bit about his own um, songwriting. So check this out. When I started writing my own songs, the folk lingo was the only vocabulary that I knew, and I used it. But I had something else as well. I had principles and sensibilities and an informed view of the world, and I had had that for a while. Learned it all in grammar school, Don Quixote, Ivanhoe, Robinson Crusoe, Gulliver's Travels, Tales of Two Cities, all the rest. Typical grammar school reading. They gave you a way of looking at life, an understanding of human nature, and a standard to measure things by. I took all that with me when I started composing lyrics, and the themes from those books work their way into many of my songs, either knowingly or unintentionally. I wanted to write songs unlike anything anybody ever heard, and these themes were fundamental. So I thought that was interesting to hear him, you know, in his own words, talk about, you know, kind of what what influenced him. And I like that he basically said he wanted to write about stuff that nobody else was writing about. So I, I think, think that's the first time whoops. I ever heard of Bob Dylan is when a publicist called... something else started playing there. Sorry, guys. Um, so what we're going to cover and talk about is really how did Dylan sort of do that and what kept him sort of i guess influential or what were people really holding on to or what made dylan stand out compared to some of the other um people of the the time so as we talked about bob dylan wrote about original topics using familiar structure or in a familiar way so he used that common structure and that helped to deliver the unique ideas and stories that he was writing about. So I think this is a huge lesson that I want you all to walk away from is try to be original in what you're writing about, but use the structure that your listeners are used to so it helps them digest the newness of what you're trying to say. And I think that's such a huge huge thing you know because i i hear a lot of songwriters that want to be rebellious and they want to break all these rules and stuff and i think the rules that you want to break is what you're saying not so much how you're saying it if that makes sense so the other thing about dylan that people don't talk about a lot is his songs were actually really melodic and the melodies actually played a big part in what made people drawn to them so it wasn't just the lyrics. Dylan was really skilled in how the melodies would match between the verses. So you you knew when you were in a verse, you knew you were in a refrain, you sort of knew where you were. And like I talked about earlier, he he was very adept in creating contrast between the sections. So you had you had his ability to write, you know, the one song that he wrote about the assassination of JFK, um um, I don't remember the title right now, but it was 17 minutes long. Like, how many people can write a 17 minute song, right? Like, you just, people would be, yeah, I mean, a lot of people could fit probably five songs into that, you know what I mean? So, so there's got to be contrast in order to make that possible. And Dylan knew that, I think. His sense of structure really came from the music and the literature that inspired him. You know, he was, as you heard in his own voice, he was a reader. He read the literature. He read the poetry. He was in New York at a time where there were the beat poets and the, the singer songwriters and the folk artists. So he was really in that scene. And that really helped influence him from a structure standpoint. And then he sort of took it further with what he was he was writing about. Um. So we already talked about this part. So we learned to tell stories from what he read and how he was influenced. His lyrics, when you look at the lyrics too, he was very visual. His, his lyrics tended to be more imagery based, more visual. 
And he used those images to make emotional points and create the emotion within the songs. He did a lot of showing and then telling, which we'll get into as we um, look at some of his songs. So one song that as I was researching for, for this workshop, one song that came up and one of the reasons why it caught my attention was this is one of my mom's favorite songs, um, Wagon Wheel. Um, I actually didn't realize that it was a Bob Dylan song um, because Darius Rucker cut it and it was actually certified eight times platinum um, when Darius Rucker cut it. It was one of the top five most popular country singles ever. So Dylan made some money on this one. Um, but what's interesting about this song um, is how it shows in the verses and it tells in the choruses. And that's something that we've talked about over and over in these workshops. Um, so if you look at the lyrics, heading down south to the land of the pines, I'm thumbing my way into North Carolina, staring up the road and pray to God I see headlights. So the first in pink, those are really the showing lines that are more visual. If he would have stopped at staring up the road, there wouldn't really be any emotion in that. So if, if it was heading down south to the land of the pines, I'm thumbing my way into North Carolina, staring up the road. If that's where it stopped, there's no emotion there. We don't know what, we don't know what context or why these things matter. But then he says, I pray to God I see headlights. So it's kind of like now all of a sudden we know that he's he's looking for other people or he's looking for the fact that he's not lost, right? Like he's looking for civilization. So the the lesson in this is you can start with images to really paint a picture, but then wrap it up at the end with why does that matter from an emotional standpoint? And as the verse continues, it says, I made it down to the coast in 17 hours. Uh, picking me a bouquet of dogwood flowers. There again, if it stopped at those two lines, we don't know emotionally why they matter. You know, I made it to the coast in 17 hours, picking me up a bouquet of dogwood flowers. Okay, <laughs> like, so what? And then it says, I'm a hoping for Raleigh, I can see my baby tonight. It's like, ah, there's the, there's where it matters and why those two lines mattered, right? So it's we're showing and then we're telling why what we just showed mattered. And we're, we're basically telling the listener why are these lines important, which I think is, is something we've talked about in these workshops before. But I think it's really awesome to see that Dylan was um, doing this type of structure. The other thing, if you notice, he is writing in different um, rhyme types. You know, we just had our rhyme workshop um, earlier this week. The Pines and Caroline, that is a subtractive rhyme. And then you have Headlights, which is an assonance rhyme, right? Because it has the I sound and then it's in a different family. So it's an AAA. And then you have hours and flowers, which is a perfect rhyme, which is BB. And then it goes tonight, which goes back to the A. So this verse rhyme scheme is A, A, B, C, C, or no, it's A, 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 sorry, B, B, A, if that makes sense. So, and again, there's six lines in this verse. So when we talk about verses have four to six lines, uh, Dylan was writing that way as well. And the reason why we say that is most of the time a verse is going to happen in about eight bars of music. So when you have eight bars of music, four to six lines usually fit pretty naturally within to eight bars of music. So the, the length of verses is really kind of influenced by the, the music. When we get to the chorus, it's almost all telling, right? So rock me mama. That's not really a, a visual. That's more of a telling. Like a wagon wheel, there's a visual. Rock me mama any way you feel. That's telling. You know, as you can see, verses are much more pink than the chorus. 
Um, so that's where the chorus then becomes the telling part, the big why of the song. In the second verse, it continues with the showing part of it. So running from the cold up in New England, I was born to be a fiddler in an old time string band, which that's a consonant rhyme based on how you pronounce those. So you're getting the end sound on the end. So this is uh, AA. My baby plays a guitar. I pick up a banjo now. That's B. Oh, North Country winters keep a getting me down. That's another B. Lost my money playing poker, so I had to leave town. Another B. And then it's an X line. So the rhyme scheme does change from the first verse to the, the second verse. But what doesn't change is the melodic motifs and the way that it sounds melodically. So you know when you hear the second verse, you're actually in a verse. So I'll stop talking for a little bit and let's actually listen to the song. And I didn't type out all of the verses, but it will be um, on this video. But pay attention to how the melodic motif changes between the sections and you can hear that contrast and you can see how the way that the words are sung creates that that familiarity within the rhyme scheme as well. So this is Wagon Wheel, which originally in the 70s, I think Dylan wanted to call it Rock Me Mama, but they changed the, the title to Wagon Wheel. So that gives you a good sense of kind of what that, that song um, sounded like, but definitely could you hear the structure that we talked about, kind of how it created that that contrast between verses and the chorus and some of the rhymes even though they weren't perfect rhymes they still gave you that sense of familiarity and it created sort of that sense of resolution um and i also think it's cool that the line that says buddy ain't turning back back to living that old life no more that line doesn't rhyme and it's really about breaking a pattern right so that would be prosody with sort of that rhyme changing and the the um you know it it fits with what he's saying so that's the prosody between the sections and john in the chat says it's co-written with bob dylan and catch a uh, sacor of old crow medicine show absolutely so old crow medicine show i think was the first or one of the first groups that that um had some success with it um i know there are recordings of dylan um practicing the song i think back in the 70s uh, where it was very, very new at the time as well. So another song that became popular that Bob Dylan wrote that um, is what he sang it, but it also found success with a little known singer by the name of Adele. Um, you know, she's just has a minor following, you know, but uh, this song is an interesting song to to kind of study. And, and it really, again, shows the it shows the structure and sort of the craft that dylan had within his songs and this follows a really common folk structure which is the a a b a structure where it's a verse refrain verse refrain there's a bridge and then it goes back to a verse refrain this song kind of doubles that where there's a musical break which is very similar to the verse. So I called it C because it was different, but it could technically be called another A where it is uh, basically the sound of the verse. It goes to a bridge and then the song ends with another verse refrain. Um, again, in this song, the verses have four lines and the bridges have four lines. So again, that four to six lines thing comes into play. Um, the verses, the four lines have an A, 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 X rhyme scheme. And the X line is actually the title line. So what, what that does is when you have a line that doesn't rhyme with the other lines, that means that a spotlight is shown and that draws attention to that line. So why would you want to draw attention to the title line? Well, that's really the hook, right? So by having that title line not match the other lines, it says, hey, look at me, this is an important line, right? And also the title line is in the last line of the section, which is probably the most powerful spot in a section. The second most powerful is the first line, 
because you remember the first thing you hear and you remember the last thing you hear most of the time um, psychologically. So if, if someone said a list of things, usually you remember the first thing and excuse me, the last thing. So again, that shines that light on that, that title. So then when we get to the bridge section, not only does the bridge have a higher melodic pitch range, so it creates contrast in pitch, but it's also creating contrast in the rhyme scheme. So in the rhyme scheme, now you go to an ABAB -B rhyme scheme, which is different than your AAAX. So that's a tool that you can use in your own writing is change the rhyme scheme between sections so it adds that lyrical contrast. So let's go ahead and listen to this song and pay attention to how it uses that AABA -A -A structure and then also pay attention to how the rhyme scheme is setting up that title. So this is Make You Feel My Love. I mean, that's a good song anyway, but when you hear Adele sing it, it's like, wow, really great song. But as you can see, the structure itself is really quite simple and it follows a very traditional kind of structure, which is, is you know, something that you can definitely try in your own writing. So my suggestion here would be maybe try writing a verse that is AAA title line and then a bridge that goes A, B, A, B, you know, just as kind of that experiment um, for yourself to kind of break out of some of your normal habits. I know I seem to write the same rhyme schemes, the same kind of verse structure. So it's fun to sort of mimic somebody else sometimes to, to try new things. Um, Ron says there's a lot of perfect rhymes. Uh, Bill says it's musically similar to Lay Lady Lay, descending chords to resolution. Interesting. I hadn't compared the two songs, but that's definitely possible for sure. So the next song we're going to talk about is Blowing in the Wind. So this is one of Dylan's, like, when people talk about Dylan, this is one of those songs that shows up on, like, almost every best of list when you start looking into to Dylan. What's interesting about this song, though, is when you look at where his influences were, you can start to see where this song came from. So Dylan dated a folk singer by the name of um, Dolores Dixon for a while in New York, and she was another folk singer in the 60s. And she used to perform a cover song that was um, a African American spiritual called No More Auction Block. And back in 60 or 61, there was a singer by the name of Odetta. She performed at Carnegie Hall in New York, and she performed a version of No More Auction Block for me. And the melody is extremely similar to Blowing in the Wind, so it's theorized that Dylan probably heard the recording of Odetta, but most likely he would hear his girlfriend singing the song or covering the song so it it found its way into what he was writing so blowing in the wind a lot of people think is kind of an adaptation of an african spiritual which i will play for you in just a sec what that sounds like but what we want to do is talk about with this song we're going to analyze number of lines we're going to analyze the length of the lines we're going to analyze the rhythm the rhyme scheme, the rhyme type, and then also talk about showing and telling. So these are the tools that you can use to analyze songs on your own as well. So that's something that I want you to, to think about as you are you know, studying other, other songs that you like and trying to see why do you like them? Why do people like them? These are the things that you can look at lyrically to try to put the picture together. And I've talked about these and we'll continue to talk about these over and over again because these kind of don't change um, as time goes on. So like I had mentioned, the song that people theorize inspired Blowing in the Winds, this is called No More Auction Block for Me, and this is sung by Odetta. This was recorded live at Carnegie Hall. So let's take a listen. So now that you have sort of that melody in your head, let's listen to... Uh, blowing in the wind 
And you'll notice the structure of this song again is a verse refrain structure where it all it does a verse and then there's a two line refrain, a verse, a two line refrain, and then it does it a third time. Um, so this is blowing in the wind. So definitely can hear the the influence of that spiritual that we listened to. Um, Bill made a comment. He said it lyrically Odette is making a statement and Dylan Dylan is asking questions. I think definitely like the second verse of this song of blowing in the wind talks about, you know, people being free and stuff that could be a, a throwback or not really a throwback or just kind of a nod to, um, you know, the strife of the African American people, you know, within within our our country. Um, John Bennett says Dylan inspired him to become a songwriter in 1969. Awesome. Yeah, I think he inspired a lot of people within his time. Um, so looking at the rhyme scheme within Blowing in the Wind, uh, this song has an X A X A A, or it's an X A X A X A B B rhyme scheme. So you have down and man which is kind of X, A. You could consider that a, a consonant rhyme as well. Um, so it is uh, man walk down or down man, and then it's sail sand. So that's an additive rhyme from man and sand. And then you have uh, fly and band, which sand and band then is a perfect rhyme. And then you have consonant rhymes happening within these two refrain lines so the the consonant rhyme between friend and wind you know you have a different vowel sound but you have that same nd sound so that creates a sense of um, alliteration and also familiarity um, and then even like the blow in in has that n sound that these two lines really have so it's kind of a you know the friend blowing in the wind it has that alliteration thing that's happening which is interesting and then wind and wind those are title lines but those are also identifiers as we talked about so when a when a word is repeated um those are considered an identifier um bill says can those two lines be one long line um they could be, but the way that usually I write down songs is when there is a melodic phrase that would initiate a line. So you usually will write it down based on how the melody is sung. So it's the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. That's a thought. The answer is blowing in the wind. So that's where it becomes how you're writing the 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 lines. It's based on how it's melodically sung, if that makes sense. But you could write it out a different way um uh if you if you hear it in a different way it's really about how you understand it but this is how i'm kind of hearing and, and seeing it uh Stu said he had not heard the phrase identifier before um so Stu, we talked about identifier as a uh in our rhyme workshop that we did on tuesday um which that workshop will be on youtube on Mon uh, sunday tomorrow um so that's where we kind of talked about that before. But a word, when it's repeated, words don't rhyme with themselves. They create an identity, which that's where, why they're called identifiers. So the lengths of the lines within this song uh, are interesting. And when we talk about length of lines, we're not talking about total syllables. We're talking about stressed syllables. So what are the syllables that are being stressed? So within this first line, the stress syllables are how, roads, man, walk, down. So you have five stress syllables. And the pattern of stressed and non-stress syllables are dumb, da-da, dumb, da-da, dumb, dumb, dumb. And then you go to the second line, which is da dum da dum da da dum. So then you have the four call man. And then it repeats this five three five three. Then it goes to a four three, and then another four three within the uh, refrain lines. And within each section, you'll notice that these stress patterns actually repeat over and over again within the song. And this is something that I don't think a lot of um, newer songwriters 
pay attention to is how the stressed syllable patterns fall within their song because that makes it much easier to write within a certain melodic structure it also helps you to create lyrical structure and how you are setting uh, expectations of your listener so if you look at the patterns between these lines they're they're the same so it's the dum da da dum da da dum 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 it alternates so it's kind of like call and response tension and release so it does a line it has a reaction that's shorter so it's longer line shorter line longer line shorter line what that does is creates forward movement because it sets it off balance every other line so it creates this kind of tick tock sound if all of these lines had five syllables it would feel like it was stable and it would just sit in one spot so what creates motion in songs is the contrast so not only are you contrasting sections but as you can see this call and response is basically micro contrast between the lines and it's something that you can pay attention to as you're writing to make sure that your songs are are moving forward a lot of us do this by instinct because a lot of the songs that we hear do this sort of naturally and it's not something that we necessarily have to think about but if you have a song that isn't flowing or something just doesn't flow right take a look at these patterns and see is there something that's that's making your movement stop? Sometimes you would consider this common meter where it's a four, three, four, three. This is the Mary had a little lamb, fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. That's a four, three, four, three pattern. The verses within this song, verses two and three, follow common meter. It's four, three, four, three. And even the refrain follows the four, three pattern. Again, this creates motion but it creates balance, which is very common. So you always have a, a call and a response. So looking now to showing and telling lines within Blowing in the Wind, you know, it also is doing a lot of showing before it starts telling. So how many roads must a man walk down? That's a showing line because it's roads, you know, man walking, that's an image before you call him a man, that's a telling line. How many seas must a white dove sail that's showing, you know, sleeping in the sand, that's image that's showing, cannonballs fly, that's a showing line. And then it becomes telling at the end. And the refrain is kind of a mix, but it's really more telling lines. So as you can see, again, the pattern of showing before telling shows up in this song as well. The um, second verse kind of does the same thing but it has a little bit more telling to it and that's usually common once you set some images in the beginning you don't necessarily have to keep painting the picture as the song goes on because your listener holds on to to what you've already established so again blowing in the wind shows before it tells it does it has a mix but it starts with the showing establishes the image that lets you see the song and then it explains sort of the emotion. So you're gonna hear this theme over and over again in my workshops. And I think it's something to, to really think about as you're writing your songs. So now let's move on to melodic tools in the context of Blowing in the Wind. So the melodic tools that you can use to analyze songs, and these are the tools that you have at your disposal as you're writing songs, um, these are numbers of phrases, the lengths of phrases, the rhythm of the notes and the rests, the pitch range, the melodic shape, and then where the line starts in relationship to the, the downbeat. So those are the, the tools that you'll hear us talk about uh, over and over again as well. From a, a melody standpoint, the melody within Blowing in the Wind basically follows the same structure as the rhyme scheme. It's a call response, call response, call response. And then there's the two refrain lines that sort of match each other. So the melodic structure again is A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C. So we've talked about in other workshops that a lot of times your rhyme scheme will match the melodic structure. And that's what's happening within uh, Blowing in the Wind. 
Each line takes up two measures and then one section or one verse refrain takes eight measures um, within the song. And each verse refrain sticks to basically the same melodic structure. There's a little bit, but not much variation between um, each verse and refrain. Also, the melody is starting on the fifth note of the scale, and it rises to the sixth before stepping down kind of to the one. So that's building tension and then resolving. So that's kind of a tension and release. So the rise and the fall of the melody really creates that prosody with the message. So you have that question, answer, question, answer, right? And there's really a four note pattern that creates a motif within this song. So I'm gonna jump over to hook pad here. And we're going to kind of visually see this um, melodic pattern that's sort of built on this four note, the da, 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 uh, one, two, three, four. And you'll see it in how this melody repeats and how it, it develops and, and changes. So definitely pay attention to the, the motif here. So do you see how there's that four note kind of pattern that's happening? Um, uh, one of the, you know, some of it sounds like in the wind that's like blow in the wind, da da blow in the wind. So a trick that you can use to create kind of a subconscious relationship between the whole song is using the rhythm pattern that is established within your title to then create, use that as a motif throughout the rest of the song to create that sort of familiarity. Um, so I thought that's really interesting with with this particular song that it's it's very simple and based on basically that four note um, motif. Other you know melodic observations: the content is built around questions and answers, and the melodic structure and the rhyme scheme is is that alternating lines too so it's that call and response and again that's another way of saying like tension and release so i think that's very very cool um most of the notes within this song they're chordal tones so that means the notes mostly appear in the chords there's a few passing tones um, but for the most part the the notes are within the chords themselves um, so there's not a lot of melodic tension within the 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 harmonic structure, um, which I think makes it sound kind of that almost hymn like quality or kind of that spiritual quality as well. And looking at harmony, the harmony tools that you can analyze songs with and that you can use as you're writing include the chord color, which is are the chords major? Are they minor? Are they seven chords? You know, are they augmented, diminished? There's also your key color, which we've talked about in other workshops, which comes down to the mode, you know, is the song in a major key? Is it in a minor key? Is it, you know, in a mixolydian mode, a lydian mode? What does that look like? The length of the progression, you know, how many uh, chords are there before the progression repeats, the number of chords, the order of the chords, and then also where in the measures the chords change. So those are all things to pay attention to as you are analyzing songs that you like. And I think that's something that I want you to walk away with from from this workshop and all of the workshops really is, you know, it's fun to have me analyze some of these songs and then you guys see it, but I think it's more powerful when you actually analyze something and see, wow, this is really what's happening within some of the songs that I really dig. 
So harmonic observations on blowing in the wind, it's really quite simple harmonically. It mostly uses the one, four, and five chords. It does throw in the relative minor um, to add some color on certain words, and it stays in the same key signature for the whole song. The guitar is the main instrument. Um, the chords are really more of a support for the melody in this particular song. The melody is really what develops the motion within uh, blowing in the wind. Other things, the chord colors are major. The verse part of it, or the first six lines, are um, more in kind of Ionian mode, so it's a major key color. But then when you get to the, the refrain, it changes the chord uh, progression and it goes to more of a Lydian progression starting on the four chord. So it, it shines a spotlight on the refrain by changing the mode. And the chords change at different places based on what's happening melodically. Some measures have one chord, others are having um, having multiple chords. Uh, Bill asks, what's the significance of starting on the fifth note of the melody? So the, the five note of the scale creates, so the, the five is a, it's still a stable, it's, a, it's the dominant tone but it wants to resolve back down to the one, right? So it has more tension built in than if you started on the one or the root, because the root is home. That doesn't have any sort of motion to it. It doesn't, it doesn't want to go anywhere. Whereas if you start on the five, it, by the nature of how we hear music, it wants to go somewhere. So that's kind of the importance of, of starting on the, the five, but it's still a chord note, right? So your, your first root chord in this case is D has the one, three, and five. So it's still hitting that five note. So it's in the chord, but it's not as stable as if you started on the one, if that makes sense. So it creates that, that motion. Um, and you can shine spotlights on your hook and your different lines by changing the chords or the mode to make them contrast to the other section. So that's something that you can try is really try to make your hook stand out and contrast from the rest of what's going on, just like Dylan did with the two refrain lines of, of Blowing in the Wind. Perfect. So the next song we're going to listen to is Like a Rolling Stone, which again is another very popular Dylan song, which actually... I believe this song got him to number two on the Hot 100 um, chart. I think this may have been one of his highest charting songs uh, back in the day. Um, this song, again, the verses have six lines. So we talk about, you know, verses having four or six lines. Here we are again. Um, but the rhyme types and the rhyme scheme, you know, it's an it's A, A, B, and then uh, C, C, B for the, the first verse. So you have rhyme, rhyme. It feels like it's not rhyming, but then you actually get that resolution at the end of this second half of the verse. Um, and then you change to the chorus where the, the rhymes are about, out, loud, proud, scrounging. Scrounging actually is a assonance rhyme it's an additive assonance rhyme with the other words so scrounge scrounging rhymes with proud loud out and about uh, as an assonance rhyme um whoops so again there's also the showing first and then telling later you know these first two lines are showing and then like didn't you is emotional it's more of that telling. Uh, people call and say, beware, Dal, you're bound to fall. You thought they were all kidding you. So it's all it starts showing and then ends with telling, um, which again, that's a pattern that you'll see in a lot of a lot of songs. But let's listen to to this song and see how you hear those rhymes and also follow that that structure. So um, one thing I didn't point out before within this song is it's interesting that during that sort of pre-chorus section, so you have a verse and then you have sort of that that next section that sounds different. It um, this this section, I know the lyrics change, but you know 
this to me feels like a pre-chorus and then it ends with your next meal what's interesting is they're he's rhyming that last line of that section with the first lines of the chorus which is actually something that's kind of fun to do even rhyming the last line of your verses with the first line of your chorus it creates a unique sort of little like subconscious zing for your listener that sounds really cool so that's a technique you can use um so i see in the chat that leslie said she's not sure which lines are showing and which lines are telling so some of these lines are very much like a mix of both showing and telling within this song but in general when you're analyzing the way that you distinguish a showing line and a telling line is is it something that you could experience with your physical senses? So is it something that you could see, hear, taste, touch, smell? That's usually a showing line. A telling line is something that you experience it more from inside yourself or inside the character. So it's more of an emotional line. So for instance like this line here through the bums a dime in your prime that's a showing line right like throwing a bum a dime in 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 your prime it's kind of insinuating this person is like young or really in their best you know their best shape so to speak but then we when you get to a line that's like didn't you you don't experience that through your senses that would be a telling line right but look at this next line where it says people call and say beware doll you're bound to fall people calling is showing but kind of what they're telling you know that you're bound to fall that's a little bit more telling because it's not something that you're necessarily experiencing so i think when you're analyzing songs and when you're trying to distinguish like those patterns um you know, that's that's the lens. Is it a sense based line or is it a more emotional sort of internal feeling line? So like you used to laugh about everybody that was hanging out. That's kind of that's very showing. Um, now you don't talk so loud. That's kind of a mix, you know, not seeming so proud that's kind of more telling because it's more about emotion. Again, it really, it, it doesn't necessarily matter exactly what you would call it as long as you sort of understand what's happening and how the, how you would use those different lines for sure. Um, Ron talked about syncopation in that song. Absolutely. Like he experimented with rhythm a lot in how he had the, Certain lines were set apart from other ones. The rhythm was fast in some lines, some lines it slowed down. But what he did was in each of those sections, he repeated that same structure, even though there were different lyrics. So it felt good to us every time those sections changed. And um, this song really had like three sections that it rotated through compared to the other songs we've listened to had, had two. Um, so that's, I, this is one of his songs that, that I, I like quite a bit for sure. The next song I'm going to play is Every Grain of Sand. And I didn't analyze this one too much. So this is where you guys get to make some notes and write down what observations you're making on this particular song. And I would love to hear how you would explain this song to me and the rest of the the people in the group so this is where you get to put on your analyzer or analysis hat but dylan i actually found a quote about how he wrote this song he said this was an inspired song that came to him it felt like he was just putting down words that were coming from somewhere else and he just stuck it out which i think in songwriting these are the best times when something just kind of falls into your lap and the song just kind of plops out and wow there it is but i don't think that happens if you don't do the other prep work right like i think there's a lot of practice and a lot of preparation that goes you know you hear the the phrase that um you know luck is the result of a lot of hard work 
kind of a thing. And I think that's that's what happens where Dylan has written hundreds, probably thousands of songs every once in a while, one is sort of channeled. So I'm pretty sure some of you experience that as well, which is the that's the, the fun time. Um, but this is every grain of sand. So put on your analyzer hats and then we'll we'll talk about it after this. So it kind of just has a musical kind of outro. Lauren, you've never heard this one before? Well, wow. <laughs> um, what are your what are your observations on on this one? What did what did you all pick up on? What are the some of the things that stuck out to you? Yeah, go for it, Lauren. Okay. Um, no, I've never heard this one. You know, my I, I love Bob Dylan. He's my favorite songwriter, but I don't know a lot of his songs. So um, I I think the song is really hard to. First of all, it's a very simple song with a simple melody. But I think to, for me, the, the, the heart of this song is every grain of sand. I mean, it comes from the Buddhist tradition, you know, the world in every grain of sand and so on. And he expresses it so beautifully. That's, that's just, that's my analysis. I could go yeah. into more, you know, I'd have to look at the lyrics more, but it really, this song really moves me. And I think he uses that term very sparingly. Yeah. Every grain of sand. And every time, he, he doesn't use it very often. I'm not sure how many times. But this is my first hearing. It just, it's just, it moves me deeply because there's something about that, that thought, that idea, that the wholeness that occurs in everything. There's a spiritual element that is very touching. Yeah, I think um, when I hear it, that's kind of what I hear as well. Is there's, there's almost like a, it's almost like he's looking at his own sort of like morality right or or more actually mortality is probably right the word that i would say it's more of like someone who's looking back on life and and all of that so yeah um it uh i see in the chat that john says dylan must have read the bible too yeah so it 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 pulls in his spiritual study studies i think i think dylan was very well read on a lot of different things and i think this one is very spiritual Stu says he bet he came up with the title first. The verses appear to set up mainly for that payoffs, uh, similar to uh, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. Um, Stu also says there's a harmonic change on line five. They're showing, but it's abstract showing. Absolutely. Uh, Bill says it's very simple AA structure for the verse and the bridge sections. There's not a lot of contrast. Um, they definitely do sound very similar, but they also sound different as well. Um, Pierre, I'll come to you, but Christine, you wanted to say something? All right, well, we wait for Christine. Pierre, what did you have to say? You know what, this is the first time I hear it too, so wow. Yeah, Lauren, he, he encapsulated the, the whole thing of that. Okay. And a lot of perfect rhymes at the beginning <coughs> set things up fairly. I thought it was said mute. Oh. No, no, it's awesome. Christine, no, are, okay. Christine, are I'm you there? I'm here. Yeah, I, okay. I, 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 this little clicker, I wasn't right. I just wanted to, I'm sorry, Pierre. Um, I wanted to say this music, that the music, I'm not a musician like you, but that, that the whole sound of the music struck me as the, like the old time religious songs from the South or wherever it was. And it struck me because, you know, he's Jewish and uh, yes, all of that. Um, he uses a lot of religious references, but they aren't necessarily all, some are Jewish, um, but I got struck me as da dum da dum da dum tune that just struck me very strongly. And then using the religious references, it's kind of like he's using the old South or maybe African American tune, and then he added to it some of the religious references. But that that that's the way it sounded to me. Awesome, <clears throat> thanks, Christine. Mm -hmm. uh, what were you saying, Pierre? Sorry. Yeah, so like at the beginning, a lot, lot of perfect rhymes. It's just kind of nice, kind of setting things up. But like I, I mentioned in the in the chat before, just to analyze his lyrics alone, we could sit there on one song, how long it would take. And of course, everyone has their interpretation. But like this song, I will definitely thank you for introducing me, introducing me to it today because I'll be uh, I'll be taking this one to really soothe the mind and just really taking all that what he had to say but yeah for me the setup was those perfect rhymes I kind of like that and then okay then we get into the really heavy stuff 
Thank you. Yeah, I think what Christine said actually, you know, about how the music does carry this song in a really sort of emotional way too. Um, you know, it it said a lot of deep things, but then when it it did the musical breaks, which kind of followed the melody or kind of what you would hear in like one of the verses, it almost gave you time to let what he had just said sink in, right? I think it was a good use of space to where it it let you sort of feel it and not just think it. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it it definitely is a it's an emotional song and um I think it's and Ron says it's very simple chord progression, most phrases have three accented beats. I actually think it may be in like three, four time or like six, eight time or something too. It's not a standard, you know, four, four um, song, which I think kind of adds to that sort of swaying feel that you get from it. And it also adds to the different, um, like the way that he's just, and each verse is really kind of like set up in sections that are like four lines. It's kind of that A, B, A, B thing, but um and then every once in a while the there's contrast melodically and sort of how he's he's um reciting those so it's it's a really cool song i'm surprised lauren that you hadn't heard it i thought this was going to be old hat <laughs> yeah well you know chad and i have been having a few private conversations on email and he knows that i'm a big dylan fan and he and he thinks i'm stuck in the past <laughs> which is true <laughs> i'm always saying i'm you know in that, first of all, yeah, I haven't heard a lot of his songs. I think it just in general, Dylan is still writing great songs. Like the last album he wrote, the one you talked about with the 17 minute thing. But there never be hits now, Chad, you're right. So yeah. my question to you, and this is an odd, it's, just, it's not a, like a loaded question in any way. Should Dylan try to write a pop, you know, a pop song now? Or has he just proven that he can? You know, he's still writing. I still think that he's writing songs just as good and in lyrics and melody as he used to. But the pop world has passed him by now. Should he try to write a hit song? I mean, that's kind of a stupid question, I guess. I'm not like Dylan. Should we try to write hit songs? Or should we try to write a song that may be a hit, but mostly it comes from our inner being, our heart, Expressing so, who we are, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, so I Big actually topic we may not have time for. No, this is this is a great question because this is what I personally struggle with within my own writing too, and I think we all do because where's the line of art and commerce, right? Because in our cultures, I say American culture, but I'm assuming in Canada and the UK too, there's this thing about well, if you do something, you should try to make money off of it right so it's like you know you should be a songwriter well usually that means you should do this as a living which means you have to do it commercially right in order to do something commercially commercially there has to be an audience for it and the biggest audiences are for the pop songs and it's for what's sort of charting and honestly it's the young people it always has been it always will be no matter how hard we fight against it, pop music is young, whatever's hot with the young people, right? So we have to make the choice as writers of what makes a difference to us and why do we write. If we write only to make money, then you have to sort of chase what's on the charts, right? Like you it becomes less about creativity and more about commerciality. So then it becomes more of, of, am I trying to appease an audience? I think that I have the most happiness and satisfaction when I write stuff that moves me myself. And I don't necessarily worry about how other people are taking it. And I think if you are an artist and you're performing your own songs, and I said this in an email, Lauren, that your job then becomes finding your tribe. Who are the people that like what you do? So it becomes an exercise in marketing more than songwriting. If you want to try to monetize it, 
if you just want to put art out into the world and kind of just have fun with it, do whatever you want. But at the same time, your listeners are still listening to certain structures. So you still kind of have to follow some quote unquote rules. But your question of should we be writing hit songs? Berkeley College of Music defines a hit song as a song that delivers the emotional intent that the songwriter wanted and the listener receives. So your song is a hit when it delivers an emotional response that you intended to give your listener. So Bob Dylan might not be topping the charts, but Bob Dylan still has a fan base. In fact, his Murder Most Foul song, the JFK song, was actually one of his first number one songs. And that didn't happen until like, was it like 2017 or something? And it's a 17 minute song but yet it would, it still was number one within that genre. We live in a world where we have the ability to put out music online. We have the ability to use social media to find our fans. We have the ability to have workshops like this. Like the playing field is so level for us now that you can kind of do what you wanna do and you should really try to write songs that deliver the message that you want to write. And you know, then you have to choose. If you're writing for yourself, you can kind of do that. If you want to write for other artists, then you have to take on their persona and you do have to sort of write for what they would say and what they would like. You know, you can't really force your art on someone else. And I think what made Dylan so popular and what has gotten him acclaim is Bob Dylan was Bob Dylan. Do you know what I mean? Like he was taking his influences and creating Dylan. And now he's like, you know, and as far as like, does he need a hit? No, he just sold his catalog for like $300 million or something. So he's good, right? Like he's not worried about money anymore. And most of us have other ways that we make money too. So we should just do it for fun. And if we can make money doing it, that's cool, you know? So that's a really long-winded answer, but hopefully that's, that's helpful. But yeah, it's a struggle for sure. Any other thoughts or, or comments on what we kind of went over today? Like, do you see yourself kind of looking at incorporating some of this into your writing? Like, what are your thoughts on, on what we've covered so far? Uh, Pierre. You know, I think you're really on a good um, uh, flow here with the analyzing songs, you know, cause you've, you've kind of mentioned it a little bit now. And then when you take an artist such as Dylan, you can see that, yeah, he followed certain things, right? And he, like you said, he, he, you have to have a, a certain structure to them. But now as us in this, in the, the, the workshops that we do with you, to take our songs, take a look at the lyrics and say, okay, and you can kind of see it. So I think that's our, you know, if we, went, we be, become better writers is to take a look at these songs that we like that resonate with us and kind of break it down. So I really like the way you, you went through all the different tools that, we should look for when studying and analyzing songs for ourselves to to become better writers so that's that's my two cents thank you again awesome um christine how this is what the part that i struggle with is you mentioned things that are uh music that i don't know how to go back to i mean yes i can go and try to figure it out in google or something but i don't know how to go back and what, what was the one word I think was syncop syncopation or something. And, and so I don't know how to say, okay, what, what does that mean? And how do I go back that I, I love all of your, um, all of your classes, as you know, as long as I can get in the passwords, but I struggle with that too. That's the other thing I struggle with is, is I don't know musically. I know what I like. I don't know how to make it that way but I just kind of wanted to know, how do you go back and say, okay, where do I find syncopation or whatever it is back in this song? How would I go and do that? So syncopation is when the, the melody sort of falls off of the strong beat. So it's, it's where you're kind of, it's more, not just a straight like you know uh -huh. on the yeah. on the beat it's where it's kind of like off so it's okay. not something 
it's something you have to kind of listen for. It's not something that you really go back and say, aha, that's where it is. So it's kind of like, um, I'm sure there's probably YouTube videos or something where okay. they have demonstrations of what syncopation is. Um, okay. Okay. But yeah, it's okay. really when it's not on the beat. That's um, just an example. That's just a sure. word I, I remember. But there's so many other examples in your in your classes, and I don't know how to go back and say, okay, where am I going to find that? What was it that, that he said again? Um, so that's that's what I struggle with. So. I think as you're writing, though, a lot of this stuff doesn't matter what it's technically called. Um, a lot of times we call things by a name just so we can sort of share things with each other. It's really okay. more about how you understand it within yourself. So when you listen to a song and you're like, oh, this song sounds kind of off the beat, okay. that would be it's syncopated, right? Okay. But you wouldn't okay. necessarily have to know that word. You could just say it's kind of off the beat if that okay. makes sense okay so don't okay. don't get too caught up in the technicality of it it's more about what are you experiencing if that makes sense okay thank you um jay chad um i'm gonna mon monopolize for a moment and i hope you'll excuse me for it um i spent the better part of this morning well multitasking so that stated uh not being able to look at the screen your ability to provide example and provide really clear explanations as to what you were stating provided a lot of context as a the the degree of instructor you are and that stated you know as i'm greedily hopping around from songwriter community to songwriter community and production community to learn as much as i can is seeing people uh, across North America, the US, Canada, and the UK, and all sorts of places just kind of gravitate towards you, that reflects a lot. And um, all of these things stated, I believe that you, your presence resonates the tenacity that you seem to have for your passion for this art. And I believe that if you remain as tenacious you are, I feel very resolute that not only in the celebration of this anniversary of your channel, but the numbers that you have, you're going to explode not just through 1000, but far beyond it. So congratulations on your anniversary. It's well earned. I look forward to seeing what you evolve and aspire to in the future. Oh, well, awesome. Thank you, Jay. That means a lot. That means a ton. So thank you. Sure. Thanks so much. Um, Stu. Um, I, I echo Jay's sentiment. Uh, yeah, well, well done. You're doing a great job and it, it, it opens new doors for us uh, with the, the kind of perspectives that you bring. Um, and you asked what we're going to do with it. I, I think what I'll do is I'll do, I, I'll look and do my own analysis of like a rolling stone. And one thing that I, I've done recently is I use the analyses of particularly the sentiment that's, that's been expressed and use it to get a start for my own song. Because, you know, if, if we were to do to say the same thing, we would all say it a different way, the same sentiment, we say it a different way. Uh, but I'll also um, do analyses of show and tell on it, because I've not, I've not really done that before. I like the way that you actually divide things up into show and tell lines. I'll add that to the, to the kind of set of clubs uh, that I do the analysis with. So very, very good. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And that's a, that's a great idea for, um, you know, like like Stu said, we we were talking a lot about structure. Um, I think Pierre said we could have a whole course on the content of what Dylan was saying. Um, and that's something that you can explore on your own to try to really figure out what was he actually singing about. And I think what Stu is saying is he's writing about a certain topic. So how can I then put my own viewpoint and my own perspective on that same topic, which is a really great um, sort of exercise to do as a songwriter? Um, because you know that that topic resonates with people. So how can you put your own spin on it? I've also heard people talking about putting the opposite. So whatever a song is saying, writing sort of a response to it or an opposite to it, which is an exercise as well. Um, let's go to Bill next. Okay. I had to unmute. There we go. Um, so as, as 
what I saw in the different songs that you showed here was Dylan like broke a lot of the rules as he went through. And then the, the last song, Grain of Sand, he very much followed the rules. A, a, you know, rhyme, 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 rhyme. But in a lot of those other songs, he, he broke the rules. He, um, he put in long pauses, like in like a Rolling Stone. He puts those long pauses before he hits a punch and things. And I, I think that's what made a lot of his songs stand out. Um, it's, as opposed to the just, you know, straightforward A, B, A, B rhyming. He really pushed things in different directions and was almost like, well, I'll use the rules here for a little bit, but then I'm just going to go off here for a second and do, give you something else. That's what I observed in what you showed today. So, Awesome. Anyway, yeah, good opinion. observation, for sure. Uh, Ron. I mean, I can mimic uh, everything that Jay said about your teaching, which is, of course, what keeps me coming back. Um, but I wanted to address a little bit of what Catherine had said also, because there is a lot of new terminology and a lot of things for, you know, I don't know that any of us are really experts and we're trying, we're all trying to learn. And so I've got a paper and I've got notepad uh, opened up here. And when I come across things like she used syncopation, I just jot it down, syncopation, look up. And so for me, that's homework for after the class. Um, because there really is a lot of stuff, and I don't think any of us are going to walk away knowing everything from each session. Um, I know Berkeley takes melody, and they make an entire uh, semester class out of it. They take harmony, make a semester class, and writing hits is another class. And they, everything is so, there's a lot of information. Uh, and I mean, I take books, you know, uh, getting ready for retirement. I don't spend a lot of money, not that there's a lot of money to have, but I take free courses and workshops when I can. I go to the library. The library is an amazing resource. Uh, at least here in Massachusetts, we can get a book from any town or city in the state of Massachusetts, and they deliver it to my local library. Um, so, Christine, there, there's a lot of resources uh, in start at square one if you're really looking to uh, learn the ins and outs of this. Uh, but also another method like um, Chad had said, it's okay to not understand unless you really want to take what we're learning and the homework, you know, you have to practice. Otherwise, it's just another information for me that's going in one ear and out the other. So the analyzation, working with lines, it's homework, we have stuff to do, and that's going to help us to learn. Absolutely. And that's, that's the same with any sort of workshop or like seminar that you take. If you just take it and sort of don't do anything with it, it, you lose it, you know? So it, yeah, I love the concept of doing homework. And honestly, that's kind of why I started doing these, these things is because having to teach something means you have to understand it, which is kind of like a, maybe a torturous way to, to like learn things. But I actually, I love sharing it because I get excited about like how songs are working, you know? Um, and I took, I think seven Berkeley courses and Ron's right. Like each one is 12 weeks and you do writing every single day of those 12 weeks and it's all on like certain topics. So if you, and they're not, they're not cheap courses, but if you have a chance to take them, they're a hundred percent worth the money and the, the time that you get with the instructors is awesome. Um, and if uh, I can chime in with one more quick uh, comment, yeah, Pat Patterson says it takes over 200 bad songs before you can get to a good one. So don't get yep. discouraged. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And that's, that's the thing is don't get caught up on trying to perfect every song because you will get stuck and not growing. Like look at songs as being practice and eventually the little you'll have incremental improvement over time. Uh, Tom. Hey, Chad, I, I want to um, just say I, I, I really greatly appreciate your workshops. They, they enrich my life, and I'm a better pe person really because of these things. And, and I oh. want to thank you from my heart for uh, thank you for sharing that. And I agree with everything Jay said. And I, I loved um, one of the comments Bill said up here that Dylan never intended to write pop songs. He wrote albums with a message, and people made them popular. And you know, maybe... Maybe he was able to pull that off. Maybe not everybody can pull that off, but I think that that's one of the key things that maybe we should all try to do is just be ourselves, write our songs, share them with the world. You know, if they, 
if you want to chase the charts, go chase the charts. Maybe if that's in your heart, go do that. If, if it's not in your heart, then write the songs that are in your heart. Um, I do have one question, though, that's really specific about something you mentioned. And I don't recall which song. You mentioned that he uh, started out with an Ionian mode theme, and then he was able to switch to a Lydian mode, I think, in the refrain or something. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on how to do that and exactly what that is for me? Yes. So that was in um, Blowing in the Wind. So a mode, and we talked about this in one of our, in the Harmony workshop, um, so let me pull up a whiteboard here. Um, can you all see the whiteboard? Okay. It like changes my screen in a weird way. Okay. So Ionian mode is the major key. So like, let's say you're in the key of C, right? That's C major. So that's your standard scale. Your next mode within the scale is Dorian, which is the, the scale that's built on starting on the second uh, degree of the scale. So that is like on the white keys on a piano, that's like going from D all the way up to D. So that would be Dorian. The next mode that you have is Phrygian, which is spelled like that. So that's the third degree. When you get to the fourth degree, that's that's Lydian. And then uh, fifth is Mixolydian. The sixth is Aeolian, which is the relative minor. So if you were in the key of C, that would be like A minor, which a lot of songs are written in the major and the minor of a, of a, of a key. So a lot of songs are Ionian or Aeolian. And then the seventh degree of the scale is called Locrian, which is built on a diminished chord and you don't you don't see a lot of songs written in locrian because the the cadence of the chords and just the way it kind of shows up melodically is just not as pleasing to our ear but it's 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 a good exercise to try writing a song in locrian at some time but so how do you establish then a mode so every mode has basically what you would call sort of like its signature chords right and how you establish a mode is you start on the chord of the mode so like if you are starting in c major you start on c major and then if you go to the like the one or the five like the the f chord or the g chord that feels like we're in the key of C because that's the dominant and subdominant chord. So that establishes the mode that we're in. So you really need basically a chord and then either the melody to establish it. So the melody needs to be in that scale or the chords need to be in that scale. So what, what I'm talking about in uh, Blowing in the Wind is the first part of the verse starts off with the root chord and then it goes kind of to the like the the four and the five so it it kind of alternates there so it's very much in the key or it's in the ionian mode for, harmonically right melodically we're actually starting mixolydian because we're starting on that fifth degree but we won't get that deep into the theory because most of the time you're just worried about the chords, right? So when you get to the refrain, then instead of going back to that root chord, it then goes to the four chord and it rises to like the five chord. And then I think it hits on maybe like, I think there's like a minor two or it, it, the way that the chords, it establishes that you're kind of no longer in the Ionian mode, you're establishing that you're in Lydian, even though you're in the same key signature, you didn't change key signatures, but the center, the harmonic center of that section has changed. So it creates the contrast. Does that make sense? Modes get really kind of heady and heavy 
when you start going into them. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think that helps just to think about it from the standpoint of the harmonic center shifts and the chords shift to a progression that would relate in this case to the Lydian mode more than to the Ionian mode. And that's how you created the contrast. Did I restate that? Exactly. And if you listen back to that song, if you listen to Blowing in the Wind, you'll hear that that refrain sounds different than the rest of the section, right? And the reason why that is, is because now it's sort of, I mean, I think rhythm changes and there's some other things that change that create the contrast, but harmonically, it's more centered around that Lydian mode. Um, and it throws in a minor chord in there too, to kind of really solidify that, hey, we've changed the, the mode that we're in. Now, did Dylan think about it at that level? Maybe, maybe not. He probably took it from another song that he heard. Um, but that's what technically and structurally what's happening is it's changing modes that makes it shine that spotlight on the, on the hook line, if that makes sense. It does cool. make sense, yes. Awesome. Great question, though, Tom. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, Chad, I'd like to thank you for the, the sessions. They're great. And I tend to be the kind of person who doesn't want to do the stuff that you're, you know, doesn't want to do the work, just wants it all to channel. And, you know, occasionally you get that, but it doesn't, doesn't happen that often. The idea that we are looking at Dylan's songs and then analyzing them and the question that you just brought up to me is, is key. I mean, did he, you know, pull, like for example, in the, I noticed in Blowing in the Wind, one of the versions had an F sharp minor in it and a B minor, right? Another version didn't have the F sharp minor. I'm not sure which is the correct one, but I'm sure that he got it from another song. I don't know if he was a big one on theory. He just had the, he's just the muse, right? I mean, muses, I don't know if muses have to be women, but, um, you know, he was yeah. the muse who defined our generation. So I guess I'm saying that I am going to, with your, because of your influence, I'm probably going to take a few courses and try cool. to figure out how to be more deliberate in my analysis of songs that I'm writing, because I think it'll be quite helpful. Yeah. Um, and uh, mixing modes is a great way to do it, too, because you, you, can, you can choose, um, if you know your modes, you, you can choose chords that are not obviously part of the, the I don't know how would you would you say the the spectrum of the song. You can just take a chord and it fits beautifully, but you would but it's from another key or another mode. And is that the key? Is that the reason that we're talking about modes, uh, Chad, to give you more variety in choosing your chord structure and your melodies? Would you say that's the key there? So everything comes down to, and every tool. And the reason why you use, use certain tools isn't just to use them at random, it's to use them to deliver a certain emotion. So each mode has its own sound, right? Like your Ionian mode, mode sounds very stable, it sounds very happy. Dorian sounds more kind of mysterious. Um, it has a different sound to it. Phrygian sounds very dark, even darker than the minor because it has some other um, notes in it that that the mind and the the order of the notes causes it to sound darker. So to your question of the reason why we want to learn modes is because we want to have as many colors to paint with as we're writing our songs. And if you're only writing in major keys all the time, you're really missing a whole other opportunity to explore, you know, different chord colors and how they, um, you know, really deliver a message. Um, Leslie, I see in the chat that you said a, a workshop on on modes. That that's actually a really great idea. I'll um, I'll work on putting something together for that. That's a great idea. Um, modes are like they're not that complicated, but they're complicated to explain. <laughs> it's it's a weird thing. Um, and and that's the thing is like there. I Lauren, to your point, like Dylan probably was not a theory person but he was a listener, right? So he was learning from Woody Guthrie and like, you know, probably just messing around, like what happens if I play this chord and then I play this chord? And that's, 
you don't necessarily have to know what mode you're in. You just have to know that you don't have to always do the one, four, and the five, right? Like you can, there's ways that you can um, try different chords out and things like that for sure. Um, Bill, I saw that you raised your hand again. Yeah, I don't know how to put the little hand in the corner there. But anyway, um, I, well, two two things. One, to just for Lauren, what Lauren was talking about, I think Dylan probably wanted to put contrast into the song when he went to the refrain. And that's what put him in that Lydian mode, whether he intended to do it or knew that that's what he was doing. And so that's what those, he changed modes without changing the key of the song and it put contrast into it. So that, that, that was my observation. But the other thing I wanted to say completely different is Chad, you know, I really appreciate all the stuff that you've put out and, um, I don't make it to a lot of the seminars because I'm on Pacific time and it never seems to line up with what with time. But I've, I've actually downloaded almost all of your recordings and I've been saving them and I listen to them. And so it, it's a great tool. So if you if you guys haven't done that, it's, it's a good thing. So you can go back and listen to these. And uh, I've gotten a lot out of them. So I, I, I want you to know, I appreciate the fact that you record them and put them out there for us to get to reuse later. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And you do a great that... job, just like everybody else said. I, it's you're a good teacher. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. Uh, yeah. Again, really quick. I uh, I saw what Leslie wrote uh, before you addressed it, and I was thinking the same thing. And when I see people address uh, things like modes versus scales, a lot of times I see people laid out either on guitar or they use the piano or a key structure that's uh, laid out uh, similarly, but they use like C major, which of course being all white keys doesn't really help. So if you were to do it, maybe starting with like C minor, where you can, a person can contextualize where the shifting takes place and how far that way we have some relative, like uh, some granular structural shifts at what we're looking at it would be a really great, I think, visual aid for a lot of people. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one last thing that I wanted to show you guys um, from Dylan himself, which I thought was interesting, but I think it, it, it adds what we're going to watch, I think adds to his mystique and sort of to, to the non songwriters. I think it resonates um, I think when you hear it as a songwriter, I think you'll see that you'll relate to it, but also, I don't know if this is good advice from Dylan himself as a songwriter, but just check out, um, what he had to say. Let's make sure I have it on the right video here, but this is, I thought this was interesting and wanted to kind of wrap up with, with this. So there's, there's more to that video that you can pull up on YouTube, but I thought that was really interesting um, to hear from him in that way. Um, Lauren, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I know we're at the end. I just wanted to mention that Dylan, you know, when you hear, when he plays, and you know, nowadays he's very cryptic. Sometimes you don't know what song he's playing. If you can catch the lyrics, you might know what song he's playing. But in his, some of his interviews, including that one, and in his book, Chronicles Volume One, he's just a straight shooter. He's not weird. And, um, I'd recommend reading Chronicles Volume 1. It's really a good book. And uh, you learn a lot about the folk music scene. And it's not, it's not a mysterious book. He, when he wants to, he can be quite straightforward. And um, I think his fame has made him reclusive. I think he reacted to fame by being um, startled by never having any private moments, never being able to go out and just be himself and so on. But when he's given a chance to speak plainly one-on-one, -on -one, he really explains himself well. And, you, and he, he also a lot talks about songwriting in Chronicles Volume 1. It's not about songwriting. It's more of an autobiography. But um, he does give some good stuff there. So I would say that Dylan can be straightforward. And when he is, it's really uh, instructional to people who like to write songs. And I would also say that writing songs, we're all here as songwriters, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do, whether our songs are appreciated by others or not. We're really using our creative muscle 
And uh, I think it's just a wonderful thing that we're all able to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Dylan books, it was just announced that this week he has a new book coming out, actually. And he um, is basically talking about other songs from his perspective on like he sort of analyzes other songs like they the new york times released some of the excerpts from it and like he breaks down some like frank sinatra songs um and there were some other songs that he is writing about too so um if you google like on google news just uh type in like bob dylan book and then there you'll find some sites that have the excerpts on there i thought it was interesting timing you know as i was preparing for for this that he has something new coming out so Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, I love the book Chronicles. I read it when it first came out. And one quote that I just wanted to share with you from the book. Um, it was a quote from his high school principal. So I don't remember why Dylan was pulled into the principal's office, but I think he was either getting thrown out of high school or he was leaving town. And, and uh, the principal says to him, and this was be long before he became famous. You may do well somewhere, son, but not here. I just love that. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Pierre, I saw you had your hand raised too. Did you want to add something? It was about the new book. Yeah, The Philosophy of Modern Song. So yeah, I'm yes. looking yeah. forward to it to see what he what he has in mind uh, and his interpretation of that. Yeah. Awesome. And I think the key to like these workshops and I'll, I'll put more together of different various songwriters because I think there's always something to learn from different styles. There's something to learn from different writers. And the thing about it is we all start with a blank page every time we start writing something. So it, it, you know, even Dylan is starts with nothing and has to figure out what he wants to write about, which I think is a cool, cool thing to think about. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for, for attending this one. This one was great discussion. Loved it. Um, the next workshop is coming up in uh, November. I think it's November 5th. I think it's that first Saturday. Um, we're going to be talking about writing choruses. Um, so last month we talked about verses or this month we talked about verses. Uh, next month we're going to talk about writing choruses. So hopefully you can make it to that. And then there's another workshop in November, that's just going to be open discussion. So basically bring your questions, bring your, you know, um, you know, anything you want to talk about or get advice from from the group. I'm not going to actually prepare anything. So that one will be all on on you guys, which I think will be fun to to hear what you guys all have to say. So thanks again, everybody, and have a good rest of the weekend. And I'll get this put up. Um, and thank you very much for the kind words that you all said it. Um, I was almost getting a little teary hearing how these help you because, um, yeah, it means a lot to connect with you guys and that I, I, you know, getting to know you from a distance. So maybe someday we can meet in person, which would be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So have a good weekend and we'll, we'll see you all soon. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.